Um, my name is Jenny. Um, I am the exhibitions officer at HWDT. And as Siobhan said, um, we are based in the very colorful town of Tobermory on the Isle of Mull where HWDT is based. And today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the work of HWDT and what we have learned about Scottish killer whales over the last three decades that HWDT has been studying them. So the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust, we are a marine research charity working to ensure that whales and dolphins are protected and valued through the Hebrides on the west coast of Scotland. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce the Gaelic there, but I might try a little bit later on. Uh, we have three main research areas, sorry, work areas. We do research, we um, educate people um, and we get to go to schools, which is so much fun. Um, and all of this is with the aim of conserving whales and dolphins. So our aim is healthy Hebridean seas for whales, dolphins, porpoises and people. Um, and here's this amazing minke whale. We really are in an amazing area. Um, we're in a global hotspot in the Hebrides and 24 species of cetacean have been seen um, off the west coast of Scotland. So the term cetacean is the collective term for whales, dolphins and porpoises all together. So 24 species, which is almost um, half of the world's um, number of species, which is pretty cool. So how do we uh, carry out our research? This is our amazing boat, uh, Silurian. She's our research vessel. I suspect that many of the people that are in this talk tonight have probably been on Silurian um, or aspire to go on Silurian. So since 2002, we've been conducting scientific surveys on board. Um, the amazing thing about our data is that it's long term so, and we collect the data in the exact same way every single year. So that means we've got this really comparable data and we can monitor um, population density changes. Um, we can track seasonal movements. We can monitor um, species distrib distributions. Um, yeah, it's amazing. So on our research vessel, we collect visual uh, data, acoustic data, and we also um, take photo ID shots, but a little bit more about that later. If you would like to join us on board, I would encourage everyone to do so. Anyone can join us on board. To date, we've had more than 900 volunteers to help us collect our data. Um, it's an amazing experience. I'm sure there's loads of people in this chat that will rabbit on at length about how amazing Florian is. Um, yeah, if you do want to get involved, then either ask us a question at the end or drop us an email and we'd love to chat to you about it. So the other part of our research is citizen science. Um, and this is where we work really closely with communities. So people living through the Hebrides, people visiting the Hebrides, fishermen and boat operators to try and encourage them to report their sightings. And so we have our very own dedicated app. Um, it's called Whale Track. It's free to download. It's currently getting updated, which is very exciting. Um, and it means that it's really easy for you to report any sightings of whales, dolphins, or porpoises, um, and even uh, basking sharks and turtles um, through the Hebrides. So um, if you see something, we really wanna know about it. So please let us know. And actually the vast majority of what we know about Scottish killer whales, uh, and in particular, the West Coast community killer whales, um, is thanks to dedicated members of the public who have reported their sightings, submitted their photographs um, uh, to other regional charities like us. Um, so there's Whale Track for HWDT and there's also Sea Watcher from the Sea Watch Foundation um, if you're elsewhere in the UK. So um, HWDT's Whale Track only covers um, our research area, which is the Clyde, the mouth of the Clyde, all the way up to Cape Wrath on the West Coast um, and as far out west as St Kilda. So, that was HWDT. Um, this talk is about killer whales though, which is something that I love to talk about. Um, but it's also a bit about um, the success stories as well as the sad stories that come along with killer whales in Scotland. The successes really are the people. As I've just said, the vast majority of things that we know about killer whales in Scotland have come from people reporting their sightings to us. Um, and the more we can get that community to grow, the better. It's been amazing to watch people become more engaged with uh, the fact that even we have killer whales here in the British Isles in the last few years. And that's thanks to um, people coming to talks like this and also things like Orca Watch, which I'm sure Steve's gonna talk about. Um, yeah, and for people sharing their amazing experiences. So hopefully we can have a bit of that at the end 
um, I'd love to hear what other people um, have experienced with killer whales in Scotland. So to start with a little bit about killer whales, um, they are the largest in the dolphin family, so they're actually not a whale at all. The largest of them are reaching uh, almost 10 meters in length. They are an apex predator, which means that they're right at the top of the food chain um, and they're really long lived animals. They are also found in all of the world's oceans. And there was what is thought to be a quite conservative estimate of over 50,000 individual killer whales on the planet. Now, I'm sure many of you know that um, killer whales are currently considered a single species. However, they are vastly different all over the planet. Um, they're in different geographies, they are very different in their behavior, in their morphology, their diet, their genetics. Um, and these all together might lead us to think that they are subspecies. Um, they even demonstrate difference in culture as well, which I find fascinating. I think it's one of the things that people really connect when um, and want to learn more about uh, killer whales is because of their similarities to humans um, in their culture. Um, so these different types of killer whales, they're known as ecotypes, and these are the groups that are, um, that are uh, known to be different by researchers. So there's these 10 main types. However, it's thought now that killer whales are more on a kind of gradual scale um, because sympatric groups are so uh, different. These changes have likely come out over hundreds of thousands of years. Um, killer whales have evolved into these different ecotypes uh, driven by changes in habitat. So just as one example, like the last glacial maximum uh, a quarter of a million years ago um, could have driven some of these changes. And actually, um, the more we know about killer whales, the better. The more studies that happen, um, we're learning more about killer whales globally every single day. Um, and currently by the IUCN endangered list, these guys on the red list are marked as data deficient because all killer whales are kind of still grouped together. However, we know that there are populations globally that are now really well studied and really well described um, and some that are um, endangered and even critically endangered. So if you're in this talk, I think it's probably likely that you know that we have killer whales in Scotland. Um, spoiler alert, the, it was in the title. Um, it's, yeah, it's amazing to see more and more people engage with them. Um, this is the bit where I try and speak a little bit of Gaelic. Um, so I'm going to uh, refer to them as killer whales today. They're also known as orca, or um, if you prefer, we can use the Gaelic, which is Madakuain, I think. Siobhan can correct me. Uh, I've got a thumbs up, so that's good. Uh, Madakuain literally translates to mean um, ocean wolf, which I think is pretty apt because um, killer whales have been seen uh, hunting in packs and it's one of the things that makes them really strong apex predators. So in Scotland, we've got a couple of different types of killer whales. Um, we've got the Eastern North Atlantic type ones, um, which are the uh, Northern Isles community, um, the Icelandic orcas that travel around. Um, that migrate across following the herring. Um, however, these groups um, have more recently been seen diversifying their food and taking more seals and shifting a bit more towards uh, mammal predation. Going on um, the tons uh, to be in lodges um, and uh, yeah, travel much greater distances than the uh, uh, Eastern North Atlantic type twos. Um, the type twos are what we know as the West Coast community. Um, they're a resident pod here on the West Coast, um, or, well, in the British Isles, but predominantly seen in the West Coast. Um, they're quite a bit larger than the type ones, um, up to one to two meters larger, um, and they predominantly feed on mammals. So they're actually quite easy to differentiate. If you see a killer whale at distance, and if you're particularly on the west coast of Scotland, um, it's quite easy to get a nice look at the eye patch. If their eye patch slopes right the way down to their belly button, which as they're mammals, they do have a belly button, um, then it's likely to be a member of the west coast community. 
Um, if their eye patch is horizontal and, and goes straight back towards their tail stock, um, like in the picture there, it's like that they're not a member of the West Coast community. And these types are morphologically different, not just in their size, but also in their teeth. Um, and this has resulted um, in their, um, this has resulted because of their feeding strategy. So you see this top jaw um, here has got quite blunted teeth. And this is a jawbone of a type one killer whale where the predominant feeding method was uh, suction feeding. So suctioning herring and mackerel in through one side of the jaw. And that um, action of the water over the teeth over time um, in successful feeding, yeah, um, blunts down the teeth like that. In comparison to this larger jaw at the bottom, that's got really sharp pointed conical teeth and that are all the same. These are of a type two mammal eating killer whale. Um, and yeah, these teeth are used for grabbing and ripping flesh. So they have to stay nice and sharp in order for them to be successful um, in finding their food. So I believe the West Coast community are actually more closely related to the Antarctic type A's than they are to the Northern Isles pods, which yeah, when they're geographically sympatric is, yeah, a really, really cool, um, yeah, it's a, there's amazing studies actually on the um, genetics and how the radiation of killer whales has happened over time. If anyone's interested, I can point you to some papers afterwards. So through this talk, I'm going to focus on the West Coast community. Um, there are really amazing groups, um, and here they are. Um, this great graphic is one that's grabbed from uh, one of our sponsorship materials. Um, the West Coast community that we have 10 individuals described to us, um, as you can see, we can really easily differentiate them from their dorsal fins, um, or in some of the females, it's easier to differentiate them with their saddle patches. So on this image, you can see that the uh, individuals with the very large dorsal fins, like this one here, John Co. Um, his dorsal fin is just under two meters tall. Uh, male killer whales have a really large dorsal fin, whereas females have a much smaller dorsal fin, like here, Lulu. And then there's also the individual floppy fin who has a floppy fin that flops over to the left, uh, compared with another local individual that flops over to the right. Let's see if my video is gonna work now. Brilliant. I think it's working. So the West Coast community, they really are, um, the vast majority of their sightings have been on the West Coast of Scotland. However, they have also been sighted elsewhere in the British Isles. Um, they've been down in Ireland a number of times, Wales, and most recently uh, they were seen down in Cornwall last year, but more on that in a minute. Um, to the best of our knowledge, they have never been seen outside of the British Isles. Um, they are also thought to be one of the least genetically diverse populations of any animal studied, um, which is likely to have led to their downfall. The West Coast community are an isolated group um, with a very large range. They're genetically distinct and they've never been recorded mixing with any other groups. Um, you might have just noticed that little porpoise sleep out in front of Aquarius, I think head there. Um, if not, you'll see more of that in a second. Um, the West Coast community are also mammal eaters. So um, the vast majority of their prey are marine mammals, predominantly porpoises, um, minke whales and seals. This is a little bit of porpoise just here in front of the beautiful small isles, just off Arden American Point. Um, this footage was really kindly um, allowed to be used by the BBC One show. They came out in 2016 and had the most incredible sighting. They came out looking for killer whales, which you can't promise killer whales to anyone. And they got this amazing sighting of them predating the porpoise. Also in 2008, I should say, um, Moon, who was one of the uh, males in the West Coast community, was found stranded on the Isle of Lewis. And he was found to have minky whale baleen in his stomach. So it's this amazing imagery of the West Coast community working as a pod um, to take down a larger whale is pretty cool. So I thought I would um, focus on a couple of the individuals of the group. Um, how could you talk about the West Coast community and not mention John Co? He is a really large male. He is estimated to be 9.9 .9 meters in length with that two meter long dorsal fin. 
as you can see, he is really easy to recognize by that big notch at the base of his dorsal fin. And if you're really lucky, you might get a good look at Fluke as well. He's got what looks like a big bite mark out of his tail. Um, yeah, really easy to recognize individual. And that means that we can get maps like this. This um, map was produced by Sea-Watch Foundation last year. It records all, or sorry, it maps all of the sightings that have been reported to Sea-Watch and HWDT from 1980 to 2021 um, of Junko. So you can see he spends the vast majority of his time or he's um, been sighted uh, the most on the West Coast up in the Hebrides, um, down around the west coast of Ireland. Um, and then last year, most recently, uh, was seen right the way down here um, off the Minac Theatre in Cornwall, which was a real surprise to us. So that was um, last year, he was sighted on the 5th of May, I think, um, off the Minac Theatre in Cornwall. And then less than nine days later, I think it was just about eight and a half days later, he was seen back off Waternish Point on Sky, right up in the Hebrides. So that's a 550 mile trip um, in approximately eight days. And all of that was just the power of people reporting their sightings to us, um, taking an interest. Um, yeah, it really helps us build a picture of what these animals are doing. We have no idea what he was doing down there. And actually Steve and I uh, gave a talk just around then um, about that sighting down in Cornwall. And then the day before we did the talk, we got our presentation sorted, everything great. Um, Dronco and Aquarius were seen off Dover and it really threw a spanner in the works because we really had to rewrite our presentations. Um, we have no idea what the boys are doing, going much further distances than they've ever been recorded doing before. Um, it's possible that they are going on scouting trips to try and find other members of their pod or other similar killer whales, but we just can't be sure. Um, so most recently, as we said earlier, John Cohen Aquarius was seen on the 8th of November, 2021, off Nice Point on Sky. So it's been a few weeks now that they've not been seen. Um, so everyone keep your eyes peeled. And this is John Cohen Aquarius together. Um, back in the 1980s, the West Coast community were um, seen in a group of 20. Then in the 90s, they were seen in a group of 14. And then most recently, um, there's actually only been two individuals sighted. So that's these two here, John Coe and Aquarius, two very large males, mature males. Um, so since 2016, it's just those two that have been sighted. Um, we don't know what's happened to the rest of them. Um, it's a pretty bleak picture. Um, but yeah, we can't, we can't be sure, um, apart from Lulu and Moon, which are confirmed deceased. So I thought I'd focus a couple more um, on a couple more of the individuals of the group. Um, this large male here is Comet, who again is one of the pods that hasn't been seen since 2016, um, when our then science officer, Dr. Connor Ryan, um, was part of a group that identified him uh, in some very old footage that was recorded over in Ireland. Um, I'm gonna try and play the footage for you now. I hope the audio works. London Derry and the here? Army set out today to direct Dobie Dick to the sea. And that explains how scientists have managed to identify this animal, which achieved near celebrity status in Northern Ireland in 1977. So this is Comet, Connor. Yeah. Known to you as Comet, known yeah. to the people of Northern Ireland, potentially, if they've got long memories, as, as Dopey Dick. Yeah, not a very nice name, but that, that's the nickname that was given at the time. So yeah. I care where it's from. The river into, into Derry and under a bridge I believe and there were photographs and footage taken um, which allowed us just recently from Facebook to, uh, to match um, the, the pictures to this individual who's well known from our catalogue and from the pictures you can tell he was an adult male back then and he's still, uh, he's still, still going so we reckon he's at least 50 years old possibly even older. So there you go that was uh who we know as Comet, and I think it was actually identified um, the video on Facebook by a member of the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group um, and shared with us to try and match in the catalogue. And then Connor at the time was able to identify him, the individual that they knew as Dopey Dick, which I think is actually a better name than Comet, just saying. Um, yeah, as our Comet. Um, and because he was a fully grown mature male at that point, we could estimate his age. Not 
what they've done. Uh, next up, if anyone watched the um, CSI of the Sea last night by Zoological Society of London, it was a really brilliant series of talks. If you've not watched it, I would really recommend you go and search it on YouTube. Um, it's all available there. You'd probably be expecting that I would talk to you a little bit about Lulu. So this here is Lulu, um, a female from the West Coast Community Pod. Um, I'm now going to get rid of that photo because we don't need to sit and stare at that. Um, so yeah, Lulu was a mature female of the West Coast Community Pod who unfortunately um, stranded on Tyree back in 2016. Um, she died from entanglement, um, which is really unusual for the species. It's really rare for killer whales to become entangled um, because they live, they're very intelligent animals. They live in pods um, and yeah, it's just a really unusual way for them to die. Uh, so the Scottish Marine Animal Stranding Scheme went out and did a full necropsy of Lulu to try and um, determine cause of death um, and learn as much about uh, the rest of the pod as well as we could. Um, they took loads of samples and it was a really bleak picture. Um, unfortunately, they found that Lulu was a particularly polluted individual. She's actually one of the most highly polluted marine mammals ever sampled, which on the west coast of Scotland in a relatively pristine environment, I think is shameful. Uh, she had over 100 times the minimum toxic dose of PCBs in her blubber. So PCBs um, were banned back in the 1980s, but unfortunately they were used as fire retardants and they were found in pretty much everything from furniture to paint to um, electricals. Um, yeah, and it's just a really stable compound. So it's really pervasive in our marine environment and it's effectively impossible to remove PCBs. Um, because killer whales are these amazing long-lived animals right at the top of the food chain, they are feeding on other animals that are accumulating as well. So because they live so long, um, killer whales accumulate all of these pollutants in their blubber. PCBs have the effect of um, affecting the immune system uh, of humans as well as uh, animals like this in the sea. Um, yeah, affecting their immune system, um, their uh, reproduction. Uh, Lulu was mature she was a breeding age but she was never she had never had a calf and it was likely that she wasn't able to have a calf um, because of the condition of her ovaries um, likely as a result of the PCBs um, and yeah it was possible that because she had such a high concentration she was quite um, kind of dozy and not quite aware and um, what was going on and that is potentially what led to the entanglement but we'll never know so it's a pretty bleak picture for this amazing part of killer whales that we know still relatively little about. Uh, we now fear that um, the rest of the pod uh, have a similar high level uh, concentration of PCBs um, that Lulu had. And so it's likely that this group of killer whales are gonna go extinct in the next few years. Um, also likely that they're some of the most contaminated animals on the planet. Um, so this population, they've not had any calves since 1992, which is when HWD first started um, recording uh, sightings of them. Um, and as we said, Comet uh, is known to be at least 57, um, if not older, although hasn't been seen since 2016. So time is running out, unfortunately, for this group of killer whales. Um, they are ocean sentinels, which means that they act as like a canary in the, in the mine or um, they really demonstrate um, impacts that are happening on their environment before the species will. Um, so it's really important we continue to track the threats, not only to them, but to other species in their ecosystem. And there are ways that you can help. Um, what the main way you can help is by reporting your sightings, um, either through whale track to us, or if you're elsewhere in the UK, uh, through the Sea Watch app. Um, and it might not be you, but it might be your neighbor or your friend but please encourage them to report their sightings and send their photos through to you, to us even, um, because not only does it give us a nice buzz in the office because we get to see some amazing killer whales, um, yeah, it really helps our data and helps inform conservation of these amazing animals. Um, and I realized that was quite a depressing end to that presentation. So should I go back and find the bit where they uh, eat the porpoise <laughs> to finish on? Um, yeah, 
that's the end of my presentation. Um, and hopefully Steve's is gonna be slightly more upbeat in how to find um, some amazing killer whales in Scotland. Well, okay, so the title of my uh, presentation is Finding Killer Whales in Scottish Waters. But um, for everyone that's concerned, uh, I also had the uh, additional title of Finding Orcas in Scottish Waters. As we've just discussed, um, yeah, it is a contentious issue. Pretty much every single time I write killer whale everywhere, some, someone writes orcas. Um, I'm going to be saying both. I probably won't be saying Madakuan or sea pandas, but um, please forgive me. Okay, so just quickly who I am. Um, so I'm not a marine biologist, so please don't ask me any serious in-depth scientific questions. And I'm definitely not an expert. Um, I'm just an enthusiast, a very, uh, I don't know, I just love, I love being around orcas. I love being around any cetaceans, but, but orcas um, definitely seem to um, add another level of emotion. Um, some, I can hear someone's, uh, someone's not muted. There's some crackling and what have you. Um, but yeah, I, I work, as a, work as a skipper and guide for Hebridean Whale Cruises out of Gerloch. And um, I've recently been working for Norwegian Orca Survey out in Norway, part of their research team um, with orcas. But um, I have to say my favourite thing is definitely connecting people with cetaceans, um, but especially orcas. And overall, uh, my most favourite thing is definitely showing people their first orcas and, and uh, seeing their reactions. Usually it makes them cry. So, yeah, what I'm just going to be chatting about, so we'll have a uh, I'll say a few words about what all the fuss is about. A few quick words about um, the Killer Whale catalogue that was released last year. Um, the different um, killer whales found in Scottish waters and how to find them. So what's all the fuss about? So to me, um, the fuss, the fuss is, is all about the fact that we can relate to them. They're incredibly intelligent animals. They're absolutely beautiful. They go around in their family groups. They have their different hunting strategies, different cultures. They're very similar in many ways to human beings. One of the great things about seeing orcas is, is it takes you away from um, the busyness and the, all the crap that we have in our lives. Um, last year, as many of you know, I had a, I had a particularly bad year. Uh, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, he nearly died three times. And um, for me, just getting out, uh, getting out next to the sea, watching the wildlife and seeing epic animals, it, it just takes me away from all of that. Um, luckily for me, uh, last year, during all the chaos, um, a couple of guys approached me. They wanted to, um, they said they wanted to film me. So uh, we've been making a film about finding killer whales and how, how seeing um, cetaceans has changed my life and, and made me... Uh, stay in Scotland rather than go back to England and quit my career. Here's some of the footage that we managed to get from last year. So all that footage was uh, filmed up during Orca Watch on the north coast of Scotland. I um, hope you all agree, it was lovely footage. Um, the film will hopefully be out within the year. Um, so yeah, I'll give you a shout when it's coming out. Um, as you could see in the last bit of the clip, um, the orcas there, it was actually the 27s. Um, the 27s had a seal. So yeah, you're, you're seeing some, sometimes some pretty grisly stuff, but it's natural, it's, it's what they do. Um, and that's part and parcel of seeing any animals in the wild. What all the fuss about is not this. Uh, this is an orca called Hoi Wei. Uh, Hoi Wei is actually the first killer whale that I ever saw. Um, she was captured off of Iceland in 1977, shipped to Windsor. Uh, she was then moved over to Clacton on Sea in Essex, where her facilities were damaged before being moved back to Windsor, and then being shipped off uh, the other side of the world to Hong Kong to entertain uh, human beings for the remaining 20 years of her life. Now these, these animals are long-lived animals. Um, for an animal to die at 20 years old 
Um, she literally only spent a year and a half of her life um, in this swimming pool with one other orca. As you can see in the photo, there's a bottlenose dolphin on the right. Um, she spent all her time living with other, uh, living with bottlenose dolphins, which as we know now, they can't even communicate with, um, you know, killer whales have different languages all over the world. It's an absolute travesty that these animals still get put in captivity. Unfortunately, um, my parents thought it was a great idea to take me here. They didn't know any better. Unfortunately, now we do know better. Um, they took me here as a six, seven year old because I absolutely love fish. I still love fish. And um, I can honestly say I don't really remember much about seeing her. Um, what I do remember is part of the show she um, splashed the crowd and lots of Chinese people got very upset. That's pretty much all I remember. Contrast, here's me uh, in 2016, after three years of searching for killer whales and having epic fails, no luck whatsoever. Oh God, I get emotional seeing this photo. Um, this is me having just seen my first killer whale. So I first saw my um, killer whales in the Murray Firth, so literally short distance from home at Burghead. And uh, here's some of my fellow WDC shore watchers who, uh, who were there watching it with me. Um, fortunately for me, uh, no one was there to witness me bawling my eyes out, shouting orcas at the top of my voice and telling Alan Airy down the phone that I loved him. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what orcas do to you. So um, I had the great privilege just before, uh, just before COVID struck. Um, it was actually in the midst of all the toilet roll crisis. Do you remember that? Um, I was over in Iceland volunteering for all the guardians. And um, there's a, as Alexa, who I see is here, will testify to, um, I was staying in Grundefjord, uh, which is an absolutely stunning part of, part of Iceland. Iceland's incredible as it is. But Grindefjord on the Snaefells Nest Peninsula is absolutely superb. And um, it's home to Lauki Tours. If you ever want to see killer whales in Iceland, you have to book on with Lauki Tours. They're the only operator that, that I would recommend to go and see orcas. But um, yeah, this statue's um, in the middle of the village. It's a sculpture that was made by a, he's a hunter. He was out on his boat and he encountered a pod of orcas and it included this individual, which is called Thunderstorm. Now this is a life-size sculpture. Um, I'm six foot five with my heels on, my walking boots. And you can see this thing, it's just, it's just massive, it's mega. Um, and the really amazing thing is the guy was so blown away, he actually took the time to contact Marie uh, from Orca Guardians and added all the correct detail of Thunderstorm's fin. You can see the ripples in the fin, the little nick near the top, and even the rake marks on the saddle patch. And yeah, I just wanted to point that out because, I mean, we all know hunters aren't the best with uh, having emotions and whatever, but this hunter was moved so much that he decided to make the sculpture and donate it to the village, which I think is absolutely awesome. So um, most of the headlines you'll see about killer whales in the UK, it's, it's always about um, the West Coast community. To be fair, it's always doom and gloom. It's always about extinction. It's always about PCBs blah, blah, blah. Occasionally there's a bit of joy, uh, as you can see here with the, the killer whales being seen off Cornwall, but they always point out the only resident killer whales. Now, personally, I absolutely hate this. I, I hate that they are called only resident. I think personally, and HWDT are going to kill me for this, but I don't think it's right to be calling them residents. They go all the way around Ireland, they go around England, both sides of Scotland, um, so they're at least resident of UK and Ireland, not just UK. And we don't even know where they go in winter. They're never seen. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think I think it's a bit dodgy. But then if we're going to call these guys residents, why not call the 27s residents? We see the 27s pretty much every single month of the year, and yet they're not known as residents. So there's, there's something wrong in our terminology with killer web. Anyway, we'll discuss with HWDT after the talk. So um, last year we had um, we had the release of the killer whale catalogue. Now this was set up um, by Andrew Foote in 2008. Um, Andy Foote has since moved on to Norway. Um, he concentrates on genetics on many other species, and he handed over the reins to this document, which he wanted to remain in the public domain, 
um, to Hugh Harrop and Karen Monroe, basically because they're the guys that are seeing the orcas the most and, and have got probably the biggest library of uh, killer whale photos in the whole of the UK. They subsequently um, asked Andrew Scullion to join them and, uh, and weirdly me, I have no idea why. Um, I, I, hands, hands on heart, I didn't really add much to this document. Um, Andrew Scullion did a lot of work in putting it together. He pretty much did all the com com compiling of the photos and the data. And uh, I think you'll all agree he's done a stunning job. Um, the Killer Whale catalogue can be downloaded free online. Um, if you go on any of the regional uh, pages up in Scotland, station pages, um, there's a, a link to the file where you can download it. Um, if anyone needs to um, find a link, if they're struggling to find a link, you can contact me on my Facebook page and I'll point you in the right direction. But yeah, um, I'll just gloss over what it includes, but it's basically every single orca that um, has been seen in Scottish waters that we believe is still alive and um, it shows the ID uh, photos. So left and right side of the dorsal fins and saddle patches where we've got them and other features such as eye patches. And as you can see here with John Coe, um, the chunks missing out of his tail. Uh, and here, for example, is the page for Aquarius. So there's approximately 200 animals in the catalog. Um, and as Jenny's already said, we've got two types of killer whales. Uh, we've got type ones and type twos in Scottish waters. But in order to help um, find them, I break them down into four different subgroups, um, just based on behavior. So it's, um, and then that gives me a way to target each one. So we've got the offshore killer whales, the Northern Isles community killer whales, migratory killer, whale, killer whales, um, and West Coast community. Now, the migratory ones, it's important to note this is Iceland to Scotland. It's not Norway. Again, Norway keeps getting mentioned in the news and on BBC programmes and all sorts. Um, it's wrong. It's wrong, 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 wrong. Um, we've had one match ever um, to Norway and that's, and that's it. Um, there might be other whales that are going between Norway and, and the UK, and I'm sure there are, but we haven't actually got any physical proof of it. And physical proof is actually a really important thing when we start talking about these animals. So how to find them? Um, so I would say the single most important thing is getting your location right. Obviously, if you're not in the right place, you're never going to see them. And then you also need to get your timing right. If, you, if you're not, you, you can be in a good place, but if you're not there in the right time, again, you're not going to see anything. And then you need to take the right gear with you. So things like binoculars and scopes. Um, sometimes you need a scope, sometimes you don't, depends how far the animals are offshore. Um, if you're in Shetland, for example, they're literally at your feet and you don't need any optics at all. Um, clothing, obviously in Scotland, we can get all seasons in one day, um, making sure simple things like food and drink and being comfortable. Um, and a, a massive change, a, ma a massive help that's uh, helped in recent years is, is all the social media groups that have sprung up. Um, we've got regional groups that cover everywhere from Shetland all the way even down into England as well. Um, so yeah, there's all these regional groups everywhere where sightings are posted by members and um, there's also WhatsApp groups as well. So make sure that wherever you're going um, or wherever you're looking for orcas in a certain area, make sure you're in those relevant groups and you can keep tabs with what's going on. Make sure you plan ahead, but also be flexible. So there's been a number of times when I've been, you know, expecting something to happen and then something completely bizarre happens. And uh, I will mention a few examples later on. And then last but no means least, luck. Um, I spent three years looking for killer whales. Um, the first time I found out there were killer whales in Scottish waters um, was in 2013 when um, John Coe and some of the members of the West Coast community were seen here in the Murray Firth. I never even knew there were killer whales here. And so, yeah, having heard about this, this uh, pod of killer whales, I did my research and thought, wow, what an amazing story. Um, you know, they're gonna be dead soon, doom gloom. So I need to make sure I see them. I didn't even know there are other orcas around. Obviously uh, spending time looking on these Facebook groups, you suddenly realize how many other orcas there are about. And yeah, I, I had such bad luck that uh, I earned the name Nay Luck. And uh, yeah, I, I was a disaster. If I went over to the Isle of Lewis to see killer whales, 
uh, on two different occasions they turned up outside my house it was just it was just getting ridiculous so let's look at the offshore orcas so the offshore orcas are obviously offshore um, they actually follow the herring and the mackerel shoals around um, pretty much constantly and these tend to be off off of Shetland um, way up to the north um, the fish also move across to Ireland and there's been a bit of research done off of Ireland but generally there's very little known about them and you really do need to be very lucky to see them. One group of people that were exceptionally lucky were a group of uh, volunteers who were on HWDT's research vessel Silurian. Back in uh, June 2018 they came across a pod of at least nine killer whales um, just off of Vatisay in the Outer Hebrides. What an amazing sighting. After quite a bit of searching through um, all the various catalogues of the Northeast Atlantic, they couldn't come up with a match. So again, another exciting thing is you can always see killer whales in our waters that no one even knows about, uh, which, which is absolutely amazing in this day and age. So um, then following the uh, release of our killer whale catalogue, um, I, I was contacted by Eve, uh, who runs Norwegian Orca Survey. She'd been sent um, some photos from southern Norway and uh, she'd matched them to three of the killer whales that were seen by HWDT off of Vatisay. And this became uh, the first and, as I say, only match um, between Norway and Scotland. Absolutely amazing. And hopefully the catalogue, I mean, the catalogue's there for everyone to use. So if anyone ever gets photos of killer whales, go through the, go through the catalogue, see if you can match them. Obviously, if you can't, um, give us give any one of the authors a shout and we'll we'll see what we can find out. OK, top tips seeing the offshore orcas. Um, personally, I'd say don't bother. Um, I would actually say you're better to focus on others. Um, it's just so difficult to see them. Um, if you're in Shetland looking for other orcas, obviously keep an eye out. Uh, you'll probably need a scope because um, they're likely to be off quite some distance. Um, in November and December this year, or last, sorry, last year, um, there were some uh, pods of offshore orcas seen. Some of the fishing, um, some of the fishing vessels came very close to shore, and uh, sure enough, these orcas were hanging around. Um, if you go on Shetland orca sightings, you'll see Hugh Harrop's footage um, of the orcas. But as you'll also see, they're you know they're still a long way offshore. So one other thing you could possibly do is. Uh, Volunteer for HWDT on Silurian. I've done it twice, absolutely amazing. Um, it's such an amazing experience. I can't recommend it enough. Um, yeah, but obviously cross everything if, you, if you're hoping to see these offshore orcas. So the ones that I, if you've never seen any orcas in Scottish waters, um, the community that I would suggest you, you go for are the ones that are seen most often. And that's the Northern Isles community. Um, they're regularly seen in Shetland and Orkney. Some of these animals have travelled over to Iceland and, and the Faroes, and they can be seen all year round. Um, the most often seen pods are the 27s, the 64s and the 65s. So just a word on the numbers. Um, the number refers to, so you can see from the picture here, we've got 27 Vela. So she is actually the mat matriarch of her pod, and um, so her pod is named after her, hence the 27s. And she is the 27th animal in the catalog, hence, hence the number. So top tips in Northern Isles community, just go to Shetland. It's simple, very, very simple. Um, but you can see them still in Orkney, um, off of Lewis at Chumpen Head is a good spot. And they've also been seen as far down as the Clyde um, in Glasgow, right, right in the, the middle, which is absolutely amazing. And as far down on the east as Stonehaven. Um, I noticed Martin Kitchings in the in the talk. Um, there's been there's been quite a few sightings of orcas um, down off of Northumberland in recent years, and uh, I wouldn't mind betting that it's some of these guys, probably the 27s, heading down that way. Um, so yeah, we're waiting with bated breath for photos from Martin one year, hopefully proving the point. So looking at um, the data that's received every year um, and put together by uh, Karen Hall from Nature Scott, um, this is a graph showing um, the average number of days uh, that orcas are seen in Shetland. And you can see this, the twin towers of July and November. So obviously they're the, they're the months I would recommend you go there to see them. Um, personally, I, I would love to go in November. That's when my birthday is, but I'm normally in, I'm normally in Norway. 
Um, so the only time I've been is actually in July. Um, normally in July, I'm working for Hebridean Whale Cruises. It's our peak season. But of course, during COVID, um, we weren't operating. So I actually had a chance to go. So as I mentioned, you need to make sure you take the right kit with you. So I loaded up with maps, um, the old catalog that I had with me, uh, my sniffer dog, Riley, and all my camera gear, and off I went. Um, I sell binoculars, just a little, little plug. I sell binoculars on behalf of Optocron and, and Scopes. And um, so I'm, I'm lucky I'm supported by Optocron, so pretty much anything I want to use, they'll give me. And what I do, I always take two pairs of binoculars with me. I have a, a compact set, uh, 8x32s, which I stick in a gilet pocket or a, or a jacket pocket, along with spare, battery, spare camera batteries, a cleaning cloth uh, for my lenses, and also um, my 1.4 extender for my camera. And I just leave them constantly in that. So that if I suddenly have to run out of my van, um, I can dash out grab, grabbing that, and I know I've got everything I need with me. The camera obviously is always on standby. And then I have another set of binoculars which basically stay in the van or the house or, or on ship, where, wherever it is that I'm watching from. Um, so I've always got a set of binoculars with me. So yeah, um, very important, make sure you join Shetland Orca sightings. It's the most amazing Facebook page ever. I mean, some of the drone footage that the guys there uh, are getting is just out of this world, it's, it's incredible. Um, there's also a regional WhatsApp group, but it's usually full. Um, you can only join it if you're actually on island, um, but it's worth joining if, if there are spaces. And, and I would say, if you do go, make sure you contribute your sightings. Don't be a taker. Make sure you give back as well to the, this amazing community that, that are allowing people in and helping them out to see orcas. So I was on the North Link Ferry uh, from Aberdeen. I woke up in the morning. I had grand plans of, uh, well, I skipped breakfast and I had grand plans of arriving and letting Riley out for a pee, having breakfast, having a nice, nice rest. And as the ship arrived um, into Lerwick, my phone pinged and this is the exact message that I got. Five Orc has just been at St. Ninian's. Couldn't believe it. Um, they hadn't been seen for about a week as well. So I'd been having kittens on route. I think they'd been down in Orkney. I couldn't believe my luck. And I don't think many other people could believe my luck either. But um, yeah, so I, I quickly got my map out, checked out where I thought I would need to go. And it, I thought a place called Bannermin. Um, I rang Hugh Harrop to check if I was on the right, on the, you know, on the right trajectory. And he agreed with me, go to Bannermin. And he told me exactly where to stand. He told me to stand on the, on the high point from the car park. So I arrived at the car park. I looked down the path. And uh, all I could see was at the bottom of the path was this beach with a very shallow bay, probably only about two metres deep, ridiculously shallow. And, and across the other side of the path, there was a stile leading up to a field full of sheep and then going up this quite big hill up to the edge of the edge of the cliffs that dropped down into the sea. I took one look at it and thought, bloody hell, I, you know, I've got, I've got a hell of a walk here. So um, I grabbed my rucksack filled it, put my camera in, filled it with water, food, grabbed my scope, grabbed my tripod, grabbed all the gear that I thought I would need. Um, I thought, yeah, I'm going to be there for about an hour or so watching, hoping and praying they'd come past. And I ran as fast as I could. And I'm not the fittest, but I ran as fast as I could, got to the top of this bloody great big hill, absolutely exhausted, dumped, just dropped all my stuff on the floor, turned around, looked at the sea, blow, 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 blow. Couldn't believe it, they were there already. The orcas were literally right in front of me. Massive panic, opened my rucksack, got my camera out. This is the first photo I took. Unbelievable. L literally, like, first look at the sea, and there's the 27s right in front of me. And at the time, I'd never seen the 27s. So I was, yeah, cock a hoop to say the least. So this is 73, and a female 73 with, with her youngest calf next to her. This is her calf again. And I watched them swim past me. This is 72. One of the males see quite a nasty rake mark along his right flank, which was actually a new mark at the time. And uh, yeah, I watched them swim past me and stood there, out, still out of breath, and thought, oh God, okay, where are they going to go now? And I could not believe they, they turned into this channel and went into the shallow bay. 
that I had to just run straight past into two meters depth of water. Unbelievable. So I had to run all the way back down to the bottom. And uh, yeah, I've managed to get this photo of 72 on his way back out of the bay. But that was a real eye opener as just uh, how amazing these sightings can be in Shetland. You're literally at sea level with them meters away from you and you can hear everything. You can see everything. It is incredible. So, yeah, spent the rest of the day following the pod around, um, just meeting loads of amazing people who were so helpful, seeing some amazing things, seeing them hunting seals. Absolutely unbelievable out of this world the best the best day i've ever had anywhere um watching killer whales and i cannot recommend it enough um now i usually take a camper van with me and uh so the camper van means that i can stay sort of on trail where wherever the killer whales are and i asked a couple of the guys where where they thought i should go so i could get ahead of them they pointed me to a place called tang wick Note the uh, lovely bit of ink inking on the, the window from Sue McDonald Harding. Thank you very much. A bit of John Co. to keep me happy. And uh, yeah, they told me about this place called Tang Wick. So I, I went there, slept the night, had a good night's sleep, woke up in the morning, and there's Nick who told me where to go looking. And he was looking a bit glum. So I, I put the kettle on, could see by his body language he wasn't seeing anything. Literally just finished my cup of tea and a great big dorsal fin appeared. Number 34 appeared literally in the bay right in front of us. Unbelievable. So, and again, off we go. So yeah, I barely had time to like breathe uh, on Shetland and here we go again, day two of action. So this was, um, this little clip was filmed at a place called Stennes. It was the next place along from Tangwick. And uh, oh, it was epic. As I arrived, um, I went to the end of this peninsula as a narrow channel and uh, this, little common seal was sat looking at me, wondering what was going on, completely unaware of what was about to happen. I've got the 27s coming right past me. I'm near H&S. And there's a seal right on the corner as well. This could get interesting. The seal has just swelled just in front of them. Oh my god. Oh look, they're after it, they're after a seal. They're definitely after a seal. Oh my god. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. Holy. Holy moly. Oh crikey. I think that I think that seal's in a whole world of trouble. Blimey. Whoa, look at this, look at these two coming in. Woo! Oh my word, I think she's got I think this one's got the seal. Oh my God. <laughs> Prepare for the cheesy sign off. Wow, that was just incredible. 27s in Shetland, baby. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, my commentary leaves a lot to be desired, but you get the point. It was absolutely amazing. And unfortunately, I stopped the camera there, but um, the seal actually popped up um, about two seconds after I stopped the video. Amazingly, that seal made it. But a couple of other seals shortly after didn't. Uh, they weren't so lucky. So yeah, um, and then we carried on watching those orcas um, before they, they headed off offshore. I managed to crack out my scope and uh, I watched them breaching so many times, tail lobbing, spy hopping, 
again, you know, absolutely unbelievable. And it, you know, it shows you the importance of having the right kit. There were plenty of other people there that couldn't see a thing. And I was just beside myself looking, watching these orcas breaching. The next time they were seen was actually off the Pharaohs where they spent another couple of weeks. So then we've got the migratory orcas. So these guys are regularly traveling between Iceland and Scotland. So every year this pattern emer has emerged. Um, they spend winter in Iceland feeding on herring and then they prey switch uh, over here in Scotland where they're feeding on seals. And um, there's a peak of sightings in May, June down in the Pentland Firth. So between Orkney and John O'Groats. And we've got just about 30 odd animals um, repeating this pattern every year. Sorry, Riley's getting uncomfortable. So yeah, um, top tips for seeing these guys. So there's, um, there's a lot of places you can go to to see them. They're not tied down to any specific location, but generally in the north, the, the further north in Scotland, the better. Um, it's a good time to see them in Shetland, April through to August. But yeah, they can be seen off of the Outer Hebrides and um, definitely off the mainland here as well. So there's a few places if anyone wants to take a photo of this, you can, there's some sightings locations there, uh, give, you a, give you a choice places to go, depending on where you want to head. So while I was in Shetland, um, one of the great things, my trip was due to end 31st of July, but um, there was a sighting of killer whales. Um, so obviously I wasn't going to leave. That'd be ridiculous. Um, now I spent the first two days chasing around after the 27s and then 10 days after that of absolutely nothing. Um, and that just shows you it's not always easy in Shetland. It, it can be a grueler. It's quite a hard place to, to actually see them. But when you see them, it is unbelievable. Um, so yeah, um, the ones that were seen at the end uh, of my trip with these guys. Um, this is Hulk and Knot. They're two of the orcas that migrate over to Iceland. Uh, if you look at Hugh's great photo on the right, you can see the size difference. Hulk is obviously the one that um, his, his name suggests the bigger size. He's an absolute beast. Um, and the other guy is Knot, who's got a beautiful witch's hat shaped dorsal fin. A bit of a arty photo of a pair of them. And yeah, this is Hulk. So it was Hulk that was my first orca. So I'm, I'm very emotionally attached to him, uh, as are several other people, Sue McDonald Harding. But he's mine. He's mine. And this is not. Um, so I was really, really lucky. I managed to get to a location on Unst, um, which is the nor most northerly island in Shetland. And um, I managed to find this spot on Lamaness. And there were a whole bunch of grey seals below me. I deliberately chose the spot because the seals were there and I could see Hulk and not approaching and I was absolutely sure they would make a kill below me but um, they traveled they looked like they were going to head straight past me and then suddenly at the last second turned towards all these seals but they didn't chase them which really really surprised me what they did instead was so clever it was a it was absolutely amazing they ignored the seals that were there and went to about a metre, a metre and a half off of the rocks, right round the edge of Lamaness. And then there were seals, somehow they knew there were seals the other side of the headland and they flushed the seals out into open water. As you can see from this sequence of photos, this seal was not very lucky at all. He was flushed out into it, or she was flushed out into open water. And you could see their strategy is absolutely incredible. So they forced the seal out into open water. And then you can see here, to the left of the seal, you've got Hulk. You can see just the tip of his dorsal fin and he's swimming parallel to the seal to stop the seal from being able to move to the left. If, it, if the seal accelerates and goes ahead, Hulk can grab it, but it basically means that the seal can only go to the right. And as you can see from the photo, Knot is coming up from behind to the right. So they've both got this seal covered. And the poor seal, you can see the water bulging in front of Knot's dorsal fin. The seal knows what's coming. He's Try, trying to accelerate, but he's got absolutely zero chance. Um, bam, not got him. And within seconds, it's over. Abs absolutely incredible uh, tactics by these two. So yeah, last year, uh, again, another blinking COVID year, 
Um, we had a really, really bumper season in the Murray Firth. So eight, April to June tends to be the time to see orcas in the Murray Firth, or these Icelandic orcas anyway. Um, so this is, a, this is probably the most famous of the, these Icelandic orcas that comes to Scotland. On the right here, we've got the matriarch of the pod. She's ID number 19. She's got a little um, sort of moon-shaped nick and a dorsal fin, and her name is Musa. Um, and she's got a pod of boys, basically. So at the back, um, you can see the big male gunner. And we had a really, really amazing succession of sightings um, of killer whales out, out in uh, Murray Firth last year. It was superb. So this is the smallest and the largest of the, of the boys in Moose's pod. Got Tide on the left and Gunner on the right. And yeah, we had a lovely time watching them. Um, got the ID photos and then left them in peace. Absolutely superb. And yeah, this was one of my victims last year making a cry, bless her, this is Gillian. Um, yeah, absolutely superb. And again, the amazing impact of seeing killer whales in Scotland. So overall, best place to watch killer whales in Scotland, I would say is Shetland. Um, the views are second to none. You can get so close to them. You don't have to go on a boat. Um, so you're, you're watching from land. You're not disturbing the animals. It's absolutely superb. However, easiest place to see orcas in Scotland, I don't think it is Shetland, and that's going to great with any of the Shetlanders that are here. I hope there's not too many tuned in. But I 100%, I if I had to save someone's life by showing them killer whales, I would tell them to go to John O'Groats and join the Orca Watch Week. Um, you, have, you can't go there on your own. You can't go there any other time. You have to be there during Orca Watch Week. And here's the reasons why. So again, one of Karen's graphs, um, this shows you that um, in May and June, the sightings between Shetland and Orkney uh, are very comparable. Um, the sightings in Shetland, you know, there, there's a few orcas moving around, but it's when Orkney and, and the Pentland Firth really comes into its own. And in particular, in 2019, you can see here that or Orkney, the sightings in Orkney completely swamped what, what was going on in Shetland. It was a particularly good year. So the guy who started Orca Watch Off is this man on the right playing with Riley, Colin Bird. He noticed the pattern that there was this, this uh, amazing peak in sightings of killer whales in the Pentland Firth in May and June. And um, when some uh, tidal uh, turbines were being installed or proposed to be installed in the Pentland Firth, he decided to set up a watch um, just to see if the killer whales were affected by the work that was going on. Pleased to say they weren't, and every year since they've still returned. So this pattern's emerged for the last best part of, I think Colin was watching 13 years before Orca Watch even started. And I think we're on year nine now. So yeah, we're looking at 20 years that this pattern's been going on at least. So yeah, I, I became a volunteer for Orca Watch and, and was organizing it um, with the help of the Sea Watch Foundation team. And yeah, I've been volunteering for them ever since. Uh, the event is just amazing. You meet so many amazing people. Um, it's just superb in every way. Absolutely love it. Got Finlay on the right here. Um, proof that um, it's good for children to go there as well. Um, you just have to make sure they don't fall off of any cliffs. There's some pretty high cliffs. Uh, Finlay, I, I was lucky enough to, privileged enough to show him his first orca by putting him up on my shoulders so that he could look down the other side of the cliff and see them. And yeah, it's a very social event, obviously without coronavirus. Um, there's a lot of eyes watching and um, a lot of experienced eyes watching, such as Colin, myself, Karen Monroe. There's a lot of, um, a lot of the regional coordinators come up, so much expertise, um, and it's always a really, really good area to watch here in the Pentland Firth with those sort of people around. And as you can see, the views are absolutely incredible. And just to give you a, a uh, an idea of how difficult it is. During my three years, I did go up there on my own, not at Orca Watch. The first time I went there, I didn't even see the sea because I was bogged down by sea fog, literally didn't see the sea. Next time I went, I was looking through my scope and a car pulled up. A couple of people got out from a camper van and went over to speak to them. Guy took out his camera, took a couple of photos. They jumped back in the car and drove off. Guys got back in their camper van. Half an hour later, they came over to me and said, oh, what is it you're looking for? And when I told them that I was looking for killer whales, 
they uh, promptly told me that half an hour ago there were killer whales and these buggers didn't even tell me that there'd been killer whales there. Couldn't believe it. But yeah, again, my, my lovely luck during those three years. But the, the moral of the story is looking on your own, you cannot look at every single part of the water. These orcas come literally under the cliffs or they can be miles out. There's also boat trips uh, on the regular ferry trip across to Orkney, and there's probably quite a few familiar faces on this, this shot. Um, as you can see from the attire, you do need to be prepared for the good old Scottish summer. And yeah, some familiar faces. So this is, again, this is Hulk. Um, photos taken from the ferry over at Orkney. Um, this is one of Hulk's favourite spots. Hulk and not regularly patrol off of Burwick, out to Muckle Scary and back. Uh, again, orcas are a real, they're real creatures of habit. They have these amazing routines that they follow. And they're there after these guys, the common seals. There's quite a few haul outs and the gray seals that are also off Stroma. There's a lot of seals around there, which, which makes it prime territory for the killer whales. There's also harbour porpoises, which are also um, hunted. Again, these were taken from the ferry. Uh, we were lucky enough to get some really amazing views of these guys. But I did have uh, a really an, an even more amazing view of porpoises last year. This is uh, when the 27s actually turned up off the north coast. And this is one of the reasons why um, I think um, going to Walker Watch is easier than Shetland. So if you look at a map of Shetland, the, the main roads don't go out. Like, there's very few places where the main roads actually go to all parts of the coast. It's a very inaccessible, there's a lot of very inaccessible areas in Shetland, very complicated coast, which makes it extremely good for wildlife, but not so easy to navigate and not so easy to find stuff. Whereas here on the mainland, um, you've got pretty much a straight, a, a linear coast on the north and also um, down the east side. So if the orcas are making their way along the coast, they pretty much follow the coast until they, they end up going offshore for some reason. So yeah, we tracked these orcas. Um, so we first saw them hunting these porpoises um, near Doonray. So this is Doonray Nuclear Power Station. This is Animal 34 from the 27s. Big male is the eldest male in the group. And um, we followed them along to Bray, uh, a bit further to the east. As you can see, beautiful sunset. And then on to Thurso, where we were so lucky. Um, they came literally at our feet. And that, that film I was talking about we actually got footage of the orcas literally at our feet. It was unbelievable. Absolutely incredible. Male 72 must have been three metres from us. It was, it was absolute insanity. And yeah, we followed them into Thurso Bay. And uh, yeah, I mean, there was no light, but there were street lights. And you could see these orcas hunting under street light. You could hear everything. It was just insane. And it was so good. We didn't go to bed. We, we went to someone's house. We had pizza. and. Uh, we decided to head um, the very next morning for first light to a place called St John's Point and there we sat and waited and sure enough we were rewarded uh, with some more amazing sightings. Um, I think the seal footage from earlier was actually from St John's Point. So yeah we saw them come past us make a couple of kills and then they started breaching and um, it was yeah just yeah mind-blowing to say the least and um, here on the right we've got James Copeland it was his first time seeing orcas. It was his 27th birthday and he got to see the 27s, woohoo! And here's a couple of other victims from previous years as well, got Bethany and Celia who, um, yeah, it's just, it's just such an amazing event, amazing people, um, amazing wildlife, it's superb and I, I cannot recommend it enough. Right, so oh. uh, final bit, the West Coast community. So, these guys are so difficult to see. They are a nightmare. They really are a nightmare to find. Um, they cover a huge area, island, all the way around um, the whole of the mainland. I think pretty much the only place in the UK they don't go to is Shetland. And I'm not sure if there's ever been a sighting in Orkney either. So for once, Shetland's out of the picture. So yeah, seeing these guys, very difficult. As we saw in Jenny's slides, um, the hot spot for seeing them is, is the Hebrides. Um, now, all I, would, all I would advise with these guys is join all of the social media channels you possibly can. Um, make sure that you're following HWDT, 
make sure that you're following me, make sure that you're following um, Hebridean Whale Cruises because we always post, as soon as we know anything about them, we always post what's going on. And also IWDG, obviously if they're over an island, then there's no point going on a mission looking for them in Scotland. You're looking for two orcas in a, a like miles and miles of sea. And again, there's some locations here for some land-based watching. Um, so I would say they spend the majority of their time following drop-offs. So if you can find a drop-off that's very close to shore, um, then you, you're on to something, I would say. Um, Caliaf Point in Mull, I don't think there is a drop-off close to it. However, it's a thing over towards the Treshnish Isles and Colum Tyreen. Um, they've been seen many a time off of that. Um, nice Point, as Jenny mentioned earlier, is a, a real good spot to watch for them. One thing I'd also say is um, they seem to have a, a thing about every year they seem to find an area and then hang around in that area or or leave that area and then return to it. So last year it was actually um, the McLeod Maidens off of Sky. Um, they spent a lot of time around there. Unfortunately, literally just out of our range from Gaelock, which was really gutting. Um, and in 2019, they spent um, quite, a, quite a bit of time off of Gaelock. We saw them three times within a week. So yeah, keep an eye on social media for those, those hot areas. So my first time of seeing John Coe, um, as this tragic photo shows, probably the worst photo of cetacean I've ever taken, but one of my favorites, because it was the first time I saw John Coe. Now you remember I said earlier, get ready for the unexpected. So end of 2018, I was with my friend Rob Lott, WDC Orca Man, and we were chatting away in Norway about what we were gonna do in 2019. And I said to him, I am going to see John Coe in 2019. I am sick to death of not seeing this amazing animal. He's gonna die soon, I need to see him. So I went home, uh, I got out as many um, bits of information from social media that I could. I went on to Orca Survey Scotland. I looked at Andrew Scullion's amazing maps that he's produced, showing you where these orcas have been seen and the routes that they follow. And I made my plans to go to Mull in March and go and watch from Kaliak Point. Well, sat at home with man flu on January the 7th, one week into 2019, suddenly my phone pings, Karen Monroe, have you seen this? And it was Charlie Phillips has posted a photo of none other than John Coe at Channonry Point. Channonry Point? What the hell? Channonry Point is bottlenose dolphin heaven, if, if any of you don't know. And uh, yeah, it's only an hour away from me at home. So yeah. Quickest uh, cure for man, man flu ever. I was up and out in my van very quickly, rang my friends who were watching him from January Point, and I just drove there, drove to Fort George, and there he was along with Aquarius. Easy. 60 mile an hour winds. It was absolute, it was a brutal day. I was sweating buckets. I was so unwell, it was untrue, but I was so over the moon. It was absolutely unbelievable just to see. The big man himself, literally there in the flesh, superb. I was doing my skipper's courses at the time, so um, I then made it my next challenge to see him from a boat, preferably when I was uh, driving the boat. And unbelievably, and I, I won't witter on about this, so otherwise we'll be here all night, but unbelievably, literally on my very first trip as a paid skipper, the first thing I saw was Jonko and Aquarius. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, yeah, and he was the only thing we saw that trip. But uh, yeah, as you can imagine, I was beside myself. So at one point, so we joined John Coe and Aquarius. We kept our distance. We had we had Aquarius over to the right surfacing and no John Coe. I thought, that's weird. And then John Coe had travelled underneath us, popped up to the left-hand side. This is a photo of him probably about 30 to 40 metres away. So we had John Coe on our left, Aquarius on our right. John Coe then swam immediately in front of us and you can see how messed up his fin is. It's absolutely crazy. Top third bends to the right um, and it actually wobbles when he's swimming along. It's really, really weird. And then he rejoined Aquarius and they carried on down past Rona Lighthouse where we left them. And um, one thing I would say is also make sure you download HWDT's app Whale Track. It is absolutely superb. Um, Hebridean Whale Cruises, we're proud to say that we're the leading 
um, contributors to sightings on the app, uh, it, but it's, it's genuinely it's superb. So here you can see on the left, this is a track from the excursion mode. So you can, if you're on a boat, so if you're on a ferry, for example, you can track yourself and then you can log all your sightings. And you can see here where, where we saw John Coe and Aquarius, um, just off the tip of Rona. Um, and you, the reason you can see the, where's my mouse? You can see the track here that they followed along here. I think we must have found him here. And then we followed him along down to here and then left headed back off. And you can see that corresponds to this drop off alongside the edge of Heinz Shoal and down Rona. And they're typical areas where you can find these guys. Next time I saw them, just six days later, um, we were on our way up to Champion Head where Steve Dodd was seeing fin whales. I gave the passengers a choice. Do you want to see fin whales or do you want to see, or well, do you want to try and see fin whales? Because it was a gamble whether we'd even find them or do you want to see guaranteed minke whales? That, that, that season we had so many minke whales off of Rona, it was untrue. Passengers all opted for fin whales, which I was very happy about. And as we set off, I joked and said, well, obviously if we see killer whales en route, then I'll stop, but anything else I'm not stopping. And literally half an hour into the trip, bam, there's Aquarius, and then shortly followed by John Co. Again, I don't know, unbelievable. Six days into my skipper career, and I've seen John Co twice absolute lunacy and again they were off of uh, the drop off off of rear ray lighthouse which is one of the land watching spots i really recommend phenomenal spot for rissos dolphins common dolphins porpoise basking shark uh, minke whales and and you can see the orcas there and then as i say aquarius was leading the charge followed by john co we got to see John Co um, chasing after Aquarius, trying to catch up with him. He was doing nine knots when I took this photo. Absolutely amazing to see. Really, really impressive animal. Um, and one thing I would say, they're noticeably bigger. I've, I've spent a lot of time around killer whales in Norway um, from a boat, especially during Norwegian Orca Survey, literally within a couple of metres of them. These guys, are, they're so much more impressive. There's something about them. They're that much bigger. Here they are together. Absolutely love this photo. Aquarius nearest to us. And then I started dropping back so we could leave them to go off in peace. Lots of very happy passengers. And then, yeah, we sat still and watched them head off over to Sky, which is one of their favourite spots. And again, there's the track on the left of uh, where, we, where we saw them on that trip. And then the very following trip, um, we went out and we found them again over near Sky. Again, that you know, it was four hours between the trips, but they were still loitering in that area. So these are photos from that particular trip. Um, at one point, the boat was stopped and they actually started swimming towards us. So this is John Coe swimming straight towards us. Aquarius then surfaced super close to us. Really, really cool. And that was the last time we saw them in 2019. And then, of course, COVID hit, the disaster that was COVID. And uh, yeah, we didn't operate that year, which was really frustrating. However, Viola had um, spent a lot of money on the boat and was keen to take the boat out, do a couple of sea trials. So we arranged a weekend, picked a day with, um, picked a day with really, really good weather. Uh, I think it was in August. And um, I thought before we went out, I'll just check on whale track. So one of the other great things about whale track is you can, you can filter the sightings. You can look at what's been seen recently or at different months of the year. You can look at which different species you're interested in. So obviously killer whales in my instance. And I, I know um, from the past that there's been regular killer whale sightings in August and September from the Ullapool Stornoway Ferry. So I happened to look that day and sure enough, the day before uh, we were going out on the boat, there'd been a sighting on whale track uh, recorded of a lone killer whale off of the ferry. Now, there's been several lone killer whale sightings off of that ferry, um, all, all the time just to the north of uh, Rua Ray. And I, I, was, I was, had it in my head, I bet that's John Kerr and Aquarius. So I, was, I had it in my head, I always wanted to go and check it out. So this was a perfect excuse. We had no passengers, literally just me, my dog, Viola and her dog, and we headed out. We got to the ferry line and uh, this is what I saw on the left. I saw this great big black thing um, 
sticking out of the water. I'm like, what the hell is that? And then on the right, I saw the uh, obvious um, John Coe's fin, but it was pointing to the left. And then the penny dropped, always heading straight towards us. So I stopped the boat and this is what happened. You'll never guess it. We've got John Coe and Aquarius coming straight at us. Look at that. Oh my God. <laughs> There's Aquarius. Oh my God. Riley, stay. Oh my God. Oh my God, look at that! Oh my God! Woo! Woo! His tail! <laughs> There's Aquarius! Oh my God! Unbelievable! Viola! Viola, look at me! <laughs> Woo! Yes! <laughs> We've just come out on a really light short trip just to have a go on the boat. And uh, oh my God, we've got John Coe and Aquarius. We've got the ultimate next to us. This is unbelievable. Oh my God. <laughs> That's that rubbish. But yeah, as you can see, you know, I was, I, I'm not normally like that on a boat trip, I hasten to add, I don't, don't do all that. But we were on our own. Um, it was the perfect setting. We'd spent so much time stuck indoors really frustrated we couldn't get out on the boat after an amazing season 2019 and yeah we just let loose when we saw them we could we couldn't believe it and the most amazing thing about that sighting was we just we ended up sitting around in that area and they were just swimming round and round and round we, we weren't entirely sure what they were doing possibly hunting um the last time we saw them um john co was actually upside down literally right next to aquarius so we're pretty sure they caught something um, but we're not sure what. But yeah, so here's here's just a few photos to end with um, of that sighting. So yeah, the amazing, it's amazing seeing them so close together. And you look at the synchronicity of this sequence of photos. It just like, exactly the same movement between them. So amazing. Storm petrol in the foreground there, if anyone's really excited. Yeah, just absolutely superb. And yeah, different angles of Jonko's fin, crazy fin. As I say, they were just going round and round and round. Really, really cool. And of course, Riley had to. Can you see the killer whales? Can you see the killer whales? Come on then, up, 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 up. He's, he's Riley's seen killer whales all over. Can you see the killer so whales? I trust him on the boat. Oh my good God. What is it, Riley? Can you see the killer whales? Oh my word. <laughs> and yeah that encounter unfortunately was the last time I've, I've ever seen them and uh, yeah it, it just with Covid I think it heightened everything that we all feel and um, yeah I, uh, it was a bad year for everyone well bad two years now for everyone but um, yeah just being able to get out there and, and see these incredible animals just it just means everything to me and, uh, and I see it on most people's faces. So many people around here, for example, never seen, even seen bottlenose dolphins. And when they finally see them, it's a real eye opener, a real change for them. And um, yeah, it can be a real life changing experience as I've found. So yeah, this was my last photo of John Coe heading off into the sunset for sail for Gellar. So yeah, thank you very much for, hopefully most of you are still here, not falling asleep. And um, thanks very much for listening. Um, I would massively appreciate you following me on Facebook or Instagram. Um, when I go away on these lovely expeditions, I, uh, I basically manage to blag lots of nice gear. Most of the time I'm volunteering, I don't get paid anything. And so, um, yeah, being able to get some nice, nice um, freebies off of companies because they see I've got lots of likes is, uh, is really helpful to me. So yeah, thank you very much.
Cheers.